What's up, friends? Welcome back to Whoa, That's Good Wednesday. I hope everyone's having a great week so far, but it's about to get better. This week is gonna be awesome. We have an incredible guest on the podcast. He is the founder and pastor of Life Church. He has a leadership podcast, and he has a new book out called Lead Like It Matters. I'm sure you know exactly who I'm talking about. We have Craig Groeschel on the podcast. Welcome to the Whoa, That's Good podcast. Hey, Sadie, I'm uh, honored to be here. Loves having you on uh, our podcast. People are still talking about it, and our church loves you. My family loves you, so thanks for uh, having thank me on your you. podcast. Hey, it was epic, and honestly, I got so many texts from friends about the podcast I was on with you because I don't get to talk about leadership a lot. Um, you know, I talk about... Uh, ministry, of course, and my love for the Lord, talk about relationships, but not a lot of people ask me about leadership. So that was a super cool perspective uh, to get to talk about. So thank you for that. Well, you that. did outstanding. You're a world-class leader, and uh, we enjoyed the time with you. And of course, the high point was kind of maybe working out with your husband. That guy's a beast. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a high point. Well, he, he literally said, he was like, Craig Groeschel is goals for me. Like that is, that's how I want to be when I'm his age. So man, the feeling was mutual. Well, before we kick off the podcast, I have to ask you the question that everyone gets asked on the Whoa That's Good podcast. And that is, what is the best piece of advice that you have ever been given? Oh, best advice ever. Great question, Sadie. Um, I would say I was probably uh, around your age, maybe a little bit older and it was just before we started the church, and I was meeting with a uh, mentor, his name is Gary Walter, mm. and he uh, he said to me, almost kind of prophetically the way he said it, it wasn't even so much advice as it was just kind of a directive uh, statement, but he said, uh, you'll, he said, you'll very likely overestimate what you're able to do in the short run, mm. and you may even be disappointed with it, which was so true, because in the early years, you know, we worked so hard and just didn't reach very many people, but he said, you'll very likely overestimate what you can do in the short run. And then he paused for a moment and he said, but you'll vastly underestimate what God can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. Wow. And when he said it, I, uh, I didn't know how true it was. I believed it, but it's, you have to be someone, you know, kind of like my age and have several decades under your belt before you really start to see just how true that is. That so often, especially kind of in our, you know, social media go viral world, we want big impact fast and we may be able to get you know uh, big influence or viral post fast or whatever but to really have lasting ministry we often are we're, we're dissatisfied with yeah. you know i'm 23 i thought i'd be doing more i you know i'm 30 i thought i'd be married by now and i'm not or, or whatever we're disappointed with the short term but we really don't have any idea and we vastly underestimate what god can do through a lifetime of faithfulness that's and that's what we're blessed to be seeing after several decades in. And uh, so I would just say, you know, hopefully to your listeners, especially um, a lot of younger spiritual leaders and younger Christians that when you serve Jesus faithfully day in, day Mm -hmm. out over not just weeks, months, years, and decades, you can have a blessed family, blessed marriage, blessed ministry, blessed friendships, and, and you'll underestimate just how special it can be. That's so good. Man, that's great advice because it's so true. And I think so many people don't make it to that long um, life of faithfulness because the minute that it didn't work fast, they, they tapped out. You know, they're like, oh, well, right. if it's not succeeding, then this is probably not where I'm called. Or if it's not succeeding, mm-hmm. this is probably not what I'm supposed to be doing. But just because something isn't successful uh, by the way that you deem it being successful it does not mean that God is not in it. And that's so true for us. I think people look at even what, what I'm doing and they're like, oh, well, it's easy for you to say you're 25 and you're doing something successful. But no, there have been so many different things things that we've started uh, that it actually took a while to grow and we're continuing to grow you know Mm -hmm. every time we start a new aspect of LO we're starting from the ground up you know we Mm -hmm. and I'm like man this is awesome but I hope I'm doing this at 50 you know and so yeah that lifeline ministry that that's where so much fruit is and it's incredible to see learning from you because you do have a beautiful family and an incredible church Um, well take us back to to before all that before you know you're the senior and lead pastor of this incredible Mm. life church. And before Mm. you have a leadership podcast, all these books written, take us back to the college version of Craig Grishel. Okay. (laughs) Okay. I was, uh, I I was probably, probably the uh, guy a lot of people hated in college. So I played, (laughs) I played uh, tennis in college. I was a frat boy and just was wild. Like a lot of, you know, college athletes or, or you know, fraternity sorority people. 
and was pr pretty obnoxious. And so <laughs> I was having a blast. You know, sin can be really fun until it's not, right? It's yep. just, a, and, and, it, and it was fun and then it wasn't. And I had a, I was president of a fraternity and we had four guys commit grand larceny. And so the, the college was gonna kick us off campus, like re get rid of our fraternity. And as a president, I decided to try to do something to save it. And I had what was kind of like a public relations move and honestly, Sadie, it was more of an undercover spiritual. I was I was seeking, but I didn't. I couldn't let anybody know because that would have been too uncool. So mm. I said, Hey, you know, we're going to start a Bible study and try to, you know, start doing some service projects. And I really wanted to start a Bible study because I really wanted to actually know what was in there. And uh, so I said that to our fraternity brothers, and they're like, the bleep we are, blah, 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 blah. And I said, no, we're going to do it. And uh, so I got, I had seven guys that actually came to our first Bible study. None of us were Christians, Sadie. Wow. We would just, we'd just read the Bible, and, and then we would pray, and our prayers were like horrible. We'd pray like, you know, God, like, protect us as we party. And God, you know, we, we just ask that Mitch's girlfriend's not pregnant. Help her not be pregnant, oh God. We, we didn't know any better. And it was uh, just reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, I read all the way to Ephesians chapter two, and I read about the grace of Jesus that we're saved, not by mm -hmm. our good works, but by grace through faith. And that was just, that was mm -hmm. when the good news became good news to me. Wow. And I didn't, uh, there wasn't like a, a preacher, or there wasn't someone witnessing to me, there wasn't a song, it was just me and the word of God. Wow. And I went out and knelt down and prayed the best kind of, um, my own version of what we might call a sinner's prayer, just a submission to Jesus. And wow. I was really uh, lost and not uh, not a moral person. Uh, and when I knelt down, I was one person. And when I stood up after that prayer, when scripture says you're a new creation, like I was different, I was new. I wasn't perfect, holy, and, wow. and, but I was I was different. Jesus saved me. Wow. And uh, I, you know, I say I, I entered ministry that day. It wasn't like I was paid. It wasn't like I was a pastor, but day mm -hmm. number one, because I was so transformed, ministry was my heart, and that's, that's awesome. been you know my heart ever since. It's incredible. So after you gave your life to Christ, um, I read that you tried to plug yourself into a church, but you didn't even yeah. know where to go to church. So you see this building on the outside, and you think, this must be it. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I grew up going to church some, and we were part of a traditional denomination, which I you know, still, still would, would typically love. But I just went to the closest gorgeous church down the street, <laughs> and, uh, and, it went, and it was just, it was pretty on the outside, but it was, I, I, there wasn't much going on on the inside. Mm. And so I tried to find the presence of God in that church and didn't really find the presence of God in the church. Wow. And so some friends invited me to a different place, and I went in and just really encountered what I'd call like the, just the... The, the, the presence and the power of God in a way that I hadn't before, where the word was alive, the worship was vibrant, and it was just, uh, it, it's, it, and to this day, I would just say, you know, there's a lot of people that don't see a need for church, but the church is the bride of Christ, and we, yeah. we need the body of Christ, and I thank God for being able to watch podcasts and watch sermons on YouTube, but nothing replaces the, um, the presence of God in community right. and church, and so that's when my faith started to grow. I actually started getting grounded because I had a lot of passion, but no real biblical roots. And it was yeah. in the church that I started to you know, learn who God is and, and, and who he is through us as part of his family. It's awesome. That's so cool. So you go to church and you get plugged in, but now you lead a church. And Life Church, I know, was literally voted like the number one place to work in the States, which that is, that's just so cool. So for you, just even cultivating a space for what church is, what are some mm -hmm. of the things that are important for you and Amy as you lead a church and, and knowing what it feels like to walk into a church and try to find the presence of God? Are there things that y'all put into place at y'all's own church that you're like, when people walk in here, this is how we want them to feel. Fam, summer is flying by between honey walking out and all of the exciting things that have been going on. My list of things to read and catch up on is really growing, which is why I love Audible. Whether I'm at home with honey, in the car driving, getting ready for the day, or working out, keeping up with new titles could not be easier with Audible. If you're a new member, it's actually free for 30 days, so this is the perfect time to join. Uh, there's a lot of stuff to pick from and a lot of new titles, but I will just go and tell you, my podcast is on it, and also you can listen to that sounds fun by our good friend Annie Downs. So on Audible, there's like 
thousands of titles to pick from, so I know you'll always be able to find something to listen to that's new. Um, you can listen to the bestseller list, new releases, and all in between. You can even play some of your favorite podcasts on Audible, like I just mentioned, like mine or Annie's. Um, so there's all types of different things for you on the app. Audible is the best place to find all your audio entertainment in one app, so talk about easy. All your favorite things to listen to is in one place, and who doesn't love that? Just making it easy for everybody. And so the app, you can find exclusive Audible originals in each month as a new member you can keep one title from their entire catalog i have so many favorites kept in the app and one earlier this year that i loved was redeeming love that i talk about all the time let audible help you discover new ways to laugh be inspired or be entertained new members can try it for free for 30 days so visit audible.com slash sadie or to make it super easy just text sadie to 500 500 like i said they are all about easy so text sadie to 500 500 and try audible for 30 days free audible.com slash sadie 100%. So we we started the church way back in 1996. And back at the time, churches then didn't look like a lot of churches look today. Mm -hmm. And so there's, I I would say in many ways, they're more accessible, meaning a lot of times when a pastor will explain theology, um, he or she, whoever's preaching, will do it in a way that is accessible, understandable. But one of the things from the very beginning that we wanted to do, we kind of had a a goal behind the scenes. We wanted people to feel needed and known. Mm -hmm. And and so as a part of the body of Christ, um, we all have a role that we're needed. And we um, we all should should be known. If you think about it, in just from a kind of a leadership perspective in churches, if let's say there's a really small church and there's a really big church, if someone is at the little small church and they both love Jesus, why do they stay at a little small church? They stay there because there's something for them to do. They're needed. It's they're good. valuable. Yeah. And if they miss, they're they're known. Someone says, "Where were you?" It take a big church. Um, why would people go to the big church for a million different reasons? Because the worship, the ministry, the missions, the impact, the Mother's Day Out program, the you know the preaching, whatever. But why would they leave? Because they might not feel needed because everything seems to be covered or they might yeah. not feel known. And so no matter the size of the church, I think in the family of God, everybody's important. Everyone has a ministry. They should be needed. And then community matters so much. There's Absolutely. doesn't matter how big or how small the church is. Uh, it feels small when there's people that love you and you love them. Yeah, that's so good. Man, I love that. That's awesome. Uh, you talk a lot about the the it factor. Um, yeah. I love how even in the book, it's uh, lead like it matters. So talk to me about the it factor and what, what that looks like, what that means, and what do you look for with the it factor when it comes to a church, and how do you even cultivate that in a space? So that wasn't something we started out to do. So we started in 1996. We started in a, in a two-car garage with 40 people, borrowed awesome. green felt back chairs and an overhead projector, which you probably, most people probably don't know what that is, <laughs> and I'm glad you don't. Okay. We, had, we had nothing at all, but we had the Bible, hmm. and we had the presence of God, and it was special. It was crazy special. There, You could sense his presence. People were coming to faith in Christ. Lives were being changed. It was amazing. Wow. And we uh, moved from a garage to an elementary school, then to a bike factory, then built a building, then out wow. and grew the building. It was too, we were turning people away. And so we were one of the first churches to our knowledge back then to say, well, what if we met in another site? So this was like in the year 1999 and that hadn't been done before that we knew of. And so we started meeting in a movie theater and then we ended up cool. uh, discovering by accident when a- Amy gave birth to um, one of our six kids um, right awesome. before church, we ran a video message and that hadn't been done much to our knowledge before. And so wow. we kind of discovered multi site So we woke up Sadie and had like seven or eight locations, which was back then, we weren't the only church, but we were one of the first churches pioneering the multi-site yeah. movement. And here's here's what's crazy. They were in the same type of buildings. They had the same worship style. They All the staff was hired under the same kind of training system. They had the same culture. They had the same messages, and the results were phenomenally different. Hmm. It was bizarre. Seven miles down the road, one place, tons of lives were changed. The other place hmm. seemed flat. And so the language we just started accidentally using was like, well, this place has it. Hmm. And this place doesn't have it. What's it? I don't know. It's a something. It's like faith. It's, it's a yeah. buzz. It's an anticipation. It's a sense of the presence of God. What is it? I, I don't know. 
And so we started to study it, and that was, uh, wrote a book in 2008 called It, that was the name of it. Uh, the new book, Lead Like It Matters, is a revised and expanded version of about half of the content is new, and, and all of it's updated. And so we started to just ask ourselves, what is it? And the answer is, we don't really know. It's the, you know, it's <laughs> the presence of God in a special way that we can't package, but we do know there are certain things that, that we do that contribute to it. There's certain cool. things we do that kill it. And so the book was kind of a study on that. So the goal yeah. isn't like to have it. Uh, the goal is to be in the presence of God and see lives change. But it is kind of a descriptive term that we say that kind of helps bring explanation and context for teaching. Spiritual leadership is what we're doing in the book. It's cool. That's so good. That's so needed, honestly, because so many people want to lead well, but they don't know how to lead. And you provide that. And you do that in your podcast, too. So I want to talk to you about the leader who's, okay, because there's a lot of people who are listening to this podcast who are in college right now or maybe mm -hmm. getting their first job. So a lot of young uh, young people probably in their 20s. So mm -hmm. for the person who doesn't have the title yet of leader, yes. or they, they're not big in the company that they just started, they're not in the leadership position, but yet they have this desire to help make the place that they're at become better. How yeah. do you lead when you're not titled a leader? Well, that's a fantastic question. And, and the first thing I would do is just, I, I would say that I, I hope that you see yourself as a leader. That's and good. it's sad to say to me how many people really do have real influence, but don't see themselves as leaders. They say, well, I'm not a leader yet because I'm not whatever. I'm too yeah. young. I don't have a degree. I don't have the title. And, you know, leadership's not title. It's not, it's not power. It's not position. Leadership is all about influence. And mm. that's, in its essence, that's what it is. And everyone has influence, right? You can be a freshman in college and you've got influence with your friends. Yep. If, you're, if you're a um, talented freshman in college, you can have influence <laughs> with your professors, right? That's good, yeah. You can, you, you can have influence anywhere if you, if you treat people in the, in the right way. So I would yeah. say, you know, don't wait for, um, don't wait until you have everything lined up. Everyone has their excuse. I'm too young. I don't have yeah. the degree. I'm not, you know, I don't have enough experience. And the bottom line is you never feel like you're completely ready. I would say start leading now. Yeah, and the question is, what are you leading to? And I read a headline about the, an article that just came out on you that said, lead your followers, right? Everybody's mm -hmm. got a social media platform. I'm, right. I'm almost certain everybody listening to this, lead your followers, point them towards something. Uh, how, how do you gain influence with people? It's not when you get the title, it's when you treat them with respect, when you That's love great. them, when you honor them. And so use your relationships, not for selfish gains, but to point them towards something that matters. And for That's those good. of us that are disciples of Jesus, there's no greater way to be a leader than to lead them to follow the one that yeah. uh, leads us to eternal life. So good. I love that. And I love that you really were doing that before you became a quote unquote leader in the way that you lead now in the sense of you were leading people in the Bible before you became a pastor. Like you mm -hmm. were sitting in a fraternity, not even knowing the Bible yourself, being like, hey, let's open the books because who you were was a leader. And so that's such a great piece of advice to recognize that you are a leader, like you are leading people one way or another. So acknowledging that leadership and <laughs> acting on it. And I don't want to speak over you, but I do want everyone to know is that, that leadership doesn't look the same way every time, meaning like like you are Sadie Robertson Huff, um, uh, powerhouse of visible influence, and that's leadership. The person who serves quietly behind the scenes and builds relational equity, that's leadership too. That's right, yeah. And you can, you can have empathetic leadership where you just where you care about people you can have a servant heart of leadership you can have administrative leadership where you're just really really organized you can have a prophetic leadership where you're speaking boldly uh you can have kind of like a collective leadership where all you do is you're introducing people and networking them together so the bottom line is you, you don't don't settle for or feel pressure to lead like others lead uh, find your strengths, your gifts. And the great thing is for a lot of your, your audiences, they don't know what's in them yet. Meaning yeah. at 22, 25, I didn't have a clue that I'd be able to do what I'm doing right now. And so I would say experiment with it, that there's, there's, uh, there's untapped spiritual and leadership potential in all of us. And just get down there and, and see what happens. Love people, give it's generously. Good. Um, don't try to make it about you ever. Always make it about loving others and pushing them towards something better. 
and uh, it'll be really fun what you discover. I love that. There's a quote that you said, and I wrote it down. It says, you will never be a leader that others love to follow if you aren't a leader that loves people. I was Absolutely. Like, that is so good because that is a lot of what leadership really looks like is loving people well. And, and God, I mean, Jesus said, like, the most important thing you do is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. So, like, the yes. best leaders are going to do that right. Like, love mm-hmm. God and love people. And, 100%. man, that's so good. And, and I love, too, you, you said this to me when I was with you last, but you were like, whenever you are in your 30s, and you said it way, way better. I'm just saying this for the, just for the people to understand, but you said when you're, when you're in your 30s, that's when you're really going to hit your stride. And mm-hmm. you were meaning it so powerfully. And to me, what it also brought me was such ease and such peace because I think sometimes I think, oh, no, what if I already, like, did the big thing, you know? Like, mm-hmm. what's the rest of my life going to be? Because I think sometimes we think, like, you know, we're defined by the big thing that we did in the past or, or the big mm-hmm. thing we're going to do in the future. But it was so cool because you were like, no, you're going to hit your stride and you're already doing great things, but you're going to continue to do great things. And how even you started this at the beginning about how you have a lifetime of faithfulness mm-hmm. ahead of you. Like that's what the goal is. And I think so many people in their 20s, they graduate college and they're like, okay, I have to do the thing now. And whether mm-hmm. they do the thing now and think, oh shoot, I just already did the thing or they don't do the thing and they think, oh shoot, I'm this my moment it's like there's so much pressure right. to like launch out of the gate and just do your thing but i love how you're saying you know what it's not just about doing one thing it's about living a life of faithfulness and for you with, with life church you know y'all have done a lot of things like Y'all, a lot of people might not even realize, like, y'all did the Bible app. Y'all started the Bible app. Like, the Bible app is a huge thing. You have an incredible podcast. You have books that's gone out. You've seen people saved week after week because of the church that you lead. You have jobs, and it's a great place to wear all these things. But I love how you didn't stop with just one thing. So how do you keep believing after you succeed in one area? How do you keep believing God for the more or for the what's next and not get stuck in where you've been? It's a really busy season from traveling to all these different places and speaking and all the things. Um, but there's not a lot of time sometimes when things get busy to shop or outfit plan or, you know, throw that in the mix of all the things. And then when you get to these events, you're like, oh, shoot, I need something to wear. That's why I love Stitch Fix. They make it so easy by saving you time and matching your size and style. Um, I know for me, I love a good date night or just a night and a dinner with friends. And Stitch Fix has really got you covered for all of those types of outfits, no matter what you're planning to do and it's really simple to get started all you have to do is take a few minutes to set up your stitch fix profile answer questions on your style and if you are willing to try new styles let them know after the quick assessment stitch fix has style experts that will match you with items unique to your style and taste i mean who doesn't love having a stylist i mean that's pretty awesome don't we all dream of that and here's our chance they also keep it in your budget and help you discover clothes that will be your new favorite piece now who doesn't all want to try stitch fix because this is pretty Pretty amazing. Stitch Fix will send five pieces in every box to try at home. So keep what you love and send back what you don't. Stitch Fix has shipping returns and exchanges that are free and so easy. I'm so excited for my new box coming in. I have a pajama set for my last box that is legit so comfy and I can't wait to see what's in my next one. The best part of it all is there's no subscription required and you can simply try it once or you can just set up automatic deliveries. However you want to do it is best. There are absolutely no hidden fees ever. So sign up for Stitch Fix and get the latest style for women, men, and kids too. So sign up today at stitchfix.com slash woe to get $20 off your first purchase. That's stitchfix.com slash woe to get $20 off your first purchase. There's a limited time offer on this, so purchase within two days of sign up. Yeah, so that's a great question. And I do think it's interesting, Sadie, I think it's harder to be in your 20s today than ever before. I mean, it's yeah. just at least way, way harder than it was when I was there. There's so much external pressure and everything, everyone's highlight reels are visible. And so you kind of think everybody's got this better life. And, and, and people can do more earlier now in, in many ways. And so there's just way more pressure. And I would just, I would really hope, like with my kids, to take the pressure off mm-hmm. of what I call like immediate visible success and say, the goal is not when you succeed, whatever that means, when you succeed in the future, when you hit your target or your goal or uh, you get the blue check mark or you get the, 
you know, yeah. six figure or you get this, you know, uh, book deal or whatever, the, whatever success is to you. The, the, the success isn't um, when you hit the mark in the future. Success is when you're faithful to Jesus today. That's success. Yeah. And, and just to, to be faithful today over an extended period of time, that's that's the goal. And what also, that's like great. you mentioned, you know, how do you succeed after the last success? The the other question is, how do you succeed after the last failure? That's <laughs> right. That's where I was going be, next. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, I don't want to. I don't want to get ahead of you, but you version, which is, uh, would be marked as one of our biggest um, kind of like gifts to the world that our church funds it, and it's on over half of a billion devices. The, the Bible app. Crazy. Well, it started out as a massive failure, Sadie. Most people don't know <laughs> it, but we tried to create the, way back in the day. We tried to create this uh, just Bible engagement. Try to get people in the Bible. So we created a website called uversion.com that was supposed to be like a uh, uh, combination between Facebook. YouTube and the Bible, where you bring content into the community around the Bible, and it failed miserably, and it like it failed, and we were killing it, and going away, embarrassment, tons of money lost, you know, pie in the face, embarrassment, and then right as we were pulling the plug on it, Apple announced that they're coming out with something called apps, which we were like, <laughs> what's an app? This was back like there was wow. no such thing, and so we went to a 19-year-old kid on staff and said, you think you can put this into a form of an app? And he's like, how hard could it be? <laughs> and in, you know, in, in like eight weeks, he built an app and we went to the uh, first day apps released, we were on there. And so it wasn't like we were the best, we were just first. And because That's we were first, awesome. we could maybe become the best or one of the best in it. Yep. So. That's a big part of it, and 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 you have to fail. You have to. You're gonna to have to fail a lot, and then when you succeed, you, we don't want to be defined by our failures and our successes. I am not the best of what I did. I'm not the worst of what I did. I'm a child of God. Period, and it's only in having that identity strongly rooted in Christ. I'm not the number of followers I have. I'm not the result of how good my last sermon was, or how many people come to the church, or how many books I sold, or whatever the measurement is. It's, it's I am a child of God. And if we, if we can internalize that, that, that's our identity. And this is so difficult in a social media world, right, where you measure everything based on externals. If you can get that internal settled, yeah. then it gives you the confidence to try the external. And whether you, if you're not afraid of failing, you'll try more. If you're not defined by your successes, you'll, you'll, you'll try more. Some, sometimes great. the greatest threat to future success is past success, right? Yep. You, you, be, you start to think you know everything. You stop being a student. And um, we, we have to stay humble. We have to stay dependent. We have to stay rooted and grounded in Christ. And then, then and that's one of my biggest compliments for you, for your husband, for your family, is just I know the tree is going to grow tall because the roots are deep. Mm, thank you. That's so good, man. That's so good. I love it. You you covered exactly what I was going to ask you because I think people either struggle defining themselves by their success or they struggle defining themselves as their failures, and both mm -hmm. are bad. You know, a lot of people don't think it would be a bad thing to define yourself as your success, except for it is because your identity cannot be found on something like that because that is a shaky ground. Because when you go into the next thing, or or even in that season, that that doesn't do anything for your soul. I mean, that's a great thing mm -hmm. you accomplish something. But that's not who you are. And then when you define yourself as your failures, well, then that can go the completely other way. And then you feel mm -hmm. worthless and less than, and now I can't do anything. And so both things are really crippling because both things leave you with a moment instead of actually letting you walk out what God has mm -hmm. for you. Um, and, right. and I love this quote you had, failure is an event, never a person, mm -hmm. um, which that's just so good. Like that, that's something that happened to you, but that's not who you are. And same with same with success, right? Absolutely. Success is an event; it's not a person. And, and the the bottom line is, say, you probably know this because you've had so much success, but you can't out succeed your insecurities. That's Meaning, there, right. there is no Preach. amount there is no amount of external success that takes away any kind of internal insecurity. And it's nope. taken me, you know, I'm, uh, you know, obviously old enough to be your dad, and probably then some. And it's, it's really, really hard to find it. It was for me in my 20s and, and my 30s. Uh, and then even in, in my 40s, it, it took a while before I started to recognize that what makes me special is not the size of the church, the size of the platform, uh, you know, not even the behavior of my kids or whatever. What, what makes me successful is a submitted heart to Jesus. That's right. And out of that, then comes the things that, that matters. It comes a, a marriage that's God-honoring. That's and right. then out of a God-honoring, Christ-centered marriage, hopefully, and in our case, thankfully, um, you know, six kids that are 
love Jesus with, with their hearts and plugged into the church. And then there comes yeah. friendships and spiritual legacy. And the things that are really special now, it's kind of like that quote I gave you earlier on. It's like, it's you overestimate what you can do in the short run. Like, I'm not getting all the things done I want to, but you underestimate the blessings, the richness of a lifetime of faithfulness. And mm -hmm. that's where the real success is. It's not in the external things that they see. It's what's inside. It's what's inside your home. It's what's inside your heart. Right. It's what's inside your marriage and your families, your friendships. That's that's where really the beauty and the success of a, a fully devoted life to Jesus falls. Come on, it's so good. This is so good. This is so good. And just I encourage you listeners to go ahead and, and make that your anchor. You know, don't wait until you reach certain successes and don't wait until you reach certain failures to have to have that revelation that, man, God, uh, who I am in Christ is my identity. Who, What God has done for me is already enough to define me and my future and my past. And so... I think you wrote a pretty good book about that subject, didn't you? <laughs> I did. I did. Yeah. So, so that's that's true. I have talked a lot I about think, this. I think you wrote that book like right after you had a baby. <laughs> I sure enough <laughs> did. Who are you following? <laughs> Y'all, this, yeah. this is so good. And, and so much of what you say and so much of what you preach is what I'm inspired by and how I want to live my life. And, I joked at the beginning that, that you're Christian's goals, but truly you and Amy have set such a great um, example to so many people on how to love well, how to lead well, how to serve well, how to be Thank humble you. in leadership. So we're grateful for that. So with that being said, let's talk about marriage for a second. Um, yes, so please. So take us to when you and Amy met. How did y'all meet and how did you pursue Amy? Okay, so I was, yeah, uh, before when I was not a Christian, I didn't live a God honoring life and I wasn't, I wasn't pure. And so when I became a Christian, I needed to like redefine and learn how to treat a woman honorably. And so I stopped dating Sadie. So I went from being party guy from girl to girl to girl to girl for two years, I didn't date. And awesome. my friends thought I was crazy. They were making hundred dollar bets back when that was more money than it is today, how long it'd be before I'd sleep with a woman and all, you know, all that kind of wow. stuff. And so I took uh, Saturday nights was normally the big party night. And I called it my, it's just really cheesy. I'm embarrassed to say it, but I called it date nights with God. And so That's awesome. I would, Come on. I would, I read books on marriage. I listened to this thing that they were called cassette tapes back in the day on marriage. And I took notes and I started writing love notes to my future wife. So I had a whole shoebox full of notes, handwritten wow. notes to whoever my wife was going to be about how I'd love her, honor. And so I spent two years doing that. Well, I did great. I didn't date anybody. I wasn't impure. And then this girl who was not really a strong Christian was flirting with me. And I thought, what the heck, I'm going to go out with her. I hadn't for two years. And so wow. 10 minutes into the date, it was obvious she wasn't planning to honor God that night. And so I said, ah, oh, I'm sorry. I got to call this date off. I got to take you home. She's like, why? I'm like, I'm a sorry. I'm a Christian and this didn't go in the right direction. <laughs> and she laughed at me. She called me names, blah, blah, blah. Well, this same girl came up about two months later and she said to me, you're so weird. There's this girl who's equally weird for you. You're all, all overboard for God. You need to meet her. Her name is Amy. No way. And that's how I met Amy. So she she no uh, told me that she was she was making fun of me and making fun of Amy being weird for Jesus. And so this was back before social media. I'd never heard of, you know, I didn't, I didn't have a way to look wow. at her. And so I looked her up and called her and and um, had kind of a blind date with her. And that's that's how it started. And now 31 wow. years later, it's uh, it's the the love is still going, it's still flowing. That is awesome. I love that so much. I always tell people like, if you live your life loud for the things that matter to you and you live your life with the convictions that you have loudly, then the right people will be attracted to you. Y'all will mm -hmm. come together. Just, I say that a lot for friendships because people are like, well, it's so hard to find friends, but then they're not actually being their authentic self and they're just, you know, going to whatever group will, you know, take them or whatever person they can find. But when you live confident and who you are and the convictions. God brings the right people. And so I love that this girl's like, y'all are both so weird. Y'all are both yes. talking about the same stuff. Y'all need to be together. That's just awesome. That's so a cool. cool part of the story, Sadie, too, is that same girl who genuinely like was mad, offended, hurt, making fun of me, uh, years later came to faith in Christ at our church, was baptized. No and yeah, so it's really, really cool wow. how it wraps around. Yeah, now she's like on fire, you know. 
Come on, that is incredible. You gotta follow your convictions. That's awesome. That is so good. That I think so many things with your life and Christian's life are so parallel. For a lot of mm-hmm. people who listen to podcasts know Christian's life, and he was also a fraternity boy who was living a crazy life, was impure before we met, and then two years before we met, he started really following Jesus. God just mm-hmm. radically saved mm-hmm. him um, in college, and he did not date for a couple years, and he mm-hmm. was listening to um, all these books on relationships and reading and studying, and so it's just so cool. So, man, there comes a time in your life where friends, if you're listening and you're partying and you're living a different life, it's never too late to stop and reset. It's never too mm-hmm. late to stop and repent and turn back to God and uh, pursue things a new way. And for Christian and yeah. I, that was stopping for us and saying, you know what? We've done it the world's way. We desire to do it God's way. Um, so talk to me about how you still pursue Amy, because the pursuit didn't stop in college. You no. still pursue her so well. What are some practical things that y'all do in your marriage to just stay close? So I, I want to try to say this as humbly as I can. And, you know, some people show the kind of the Instagram marriage and then they, they go home and it's not so good. Like we genuinely, honest to goodness, have a very, very special, amazing, intimate, strong, Christ-centered mm-hmm. marriage. Awesome. And it didn't happen by accident. Uh, and it's, I, I say that because I want people to know it's possible because so many people don't, don't think it's possible. And so it's been, you know, in the, in the early years, like, like kind of what Kristen did, you guys have a world, world-class marriage, is he was intentional going into it. So you don't have a great marriage by accident. It's only by intentionality. And the whole culture, the way everything is designed, is basically the drift is toward a bad marriage, meaning you're going to be busy, you're going to be distracted, you're going to be binging on Netflix, you're going to be looking at your social media, you're going to, you're going to have kids, and then suddenly center your lives around your kids and not mm-hmm. around Christ or not around guarding your marriage. And so it, without intentionality, we will not have good marriages. And so mm-hmm. we have to fight against everything. Another piece of good advice that we got years ago, there was a, um, an advice piece in uh, the news that said, uh, neglect the rest of the world if you have to, but never neglect your marriage spouse, your spouse. And so Amy and I, you know, back when you'd put stuff up on the refrigerator, we cut that out and put a magnet on it and put it on the refrigerator and and tried to live that. So how do we pursue each other? Uh, Always, all the time in all sorts of ways. Today, I sent her flirty texts. She sent me flirty texts back. Um, uh, uh, last night, you know, at the, uh, when I came home, she just like ran up to me and was kissing all over me for no apparent reason. You know, it's just, (laughs) it's just, it's just, it, it, what happens is, and then it's, it's not just like the, in the ways people think, like I buy her flowers all the time before I could buy her flowers, I'd pick her flowers. You know, it's not just those things, but it's listening and it's talking and it's, it's understanding that one of the biggest ways I'll pursue her is just letting her talk about what she's going through. And that's a form of pursuit. Other things she helped me learn is that, especially when we had little kids, like helping with little kids, one of the most romantic things I could do is give a kid a bath, right? <laughs> that's right. Um, un- unload the dishwasher. And yeah. so it's just, it's being others focused, s- serving, um, verbal expression really, really matters. If you think something good, say it every time. Always say it, set it free. If you think something special, do it. Don't don't hold back. And it's kind of like financial investing. If you invest a little bit over time, it compounds. The same is true in marriage. If you invest a little bit doing the right things, just little things over and over and over again, it compounds. The intimacy grows. Next thing you know, you're kissing more. Next thing you know, you're talking more. Next thing you know, you have more babies. Next (laughs) thing you know, you're going on more trips. And 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 then you you know everything matters. Sadie, it's being around the right friends. Yeah. If you want a good marriage, let's find a few couples with good marriages. Yeah, um, that's it's good. being involved in a church, it's community, it's it's worshiping together, it's praying together. I could go on and on and on, but that's good. it's 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 having a Christ centered life, dying to ourselves, mm. laying down our lives to serve each other. And it's just it's it's the most rewarding work you'll ever do because it's work and it's rewarding. That's so good. I love that, man. You were telling us so much good advice when we were there with y'all, you and Amy both. And one of the things y'all told us is to go on walks together because yeah. it's so good for a couple. And since then, Christian and I have literally, every day we've been home, we've gone on a walk together. And it has been so awesome because 
that's like a time where honey's in the stroller so we're undistracted by honey we're not chasing her all around which she's a good distraction but she's a distraction sometimes so she's in the stroller and we're walking and we're talking and that's the time of our day where he gets to hear about my day and I get to hear about his and like it has just been so good for us and so yeah making time for those specific things y'all do is awesome and here's here's a few reasons why that works and there's a lot of things that works that's not the magic key but being outside where there's no ceiling and under God's creation, there's something about that, the out, n- n- vitamin D, all that stuff. Uh, walking and exercising next to each other, you, it, you basically your, your mind is releasing certain chemicals, feel good chemicals, and when mm-hmm. you feel good with somebody else, you like them more. So that's just that's kind of cool. the, a little bit of science behind it. And then most guys, not all guys, but most women like face-to-face communication. Like Amy likes to sit there and look at me and I get real uncomfortable. <laughs> but when you're side to side doing something, men tend to open up more. Wow. And so this, the whole walking side by side, when else are we, we're not going to have a, you know, a 45 minute face to face conversation because our phones are going to ding or yeah. kids going to need something or something's going to happen. But when you're out walking for 45 minutes, you know, it tends to let the conversations flow. And that, that is up at the top of the list of things for us. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be it's walking, cool. but it's an activity you do together, something you enjoy together. Uh, is creates an environment for that that um, remote uh, emotional intimacy it's awesome. and physically you feel better when you walk and such so there's a lot of benefits to it that's so cool well, you've definitely seen that it's been awesome for us okay so lastly I want to ask you about just pursuing God you know um, yeah. you obviously everything you do is for God but how do you continue to pursue God because I think you know sometimes even even for me like everything I do is for God you know it's like I do this podcast to bring people closer to him. I, I preach sermons to bring people closer to him. I do blogs and mm-hmm. YouTube and Instagram and all that stuff. But it's like, I still need to pursue God in that one-on-one relationship. What are ways that you've found that have helped you just pursue God through all these years and continue to walk in that faithfulness that you talked about? So I uh, said, I'll give you a choice. Do you want the preacher answer or do you want the uh, raw, true answer? I want the raw truth. Yeah. I, ba- I baited you because I knew you'd say that, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so, want okay, the raw so truth. The answer is, how do I pursue God? And the truth is sometimes better than others. Yeah. Okay. It's good. And so uh, to go, to be real authentic with you, like I had a radical transformation, came to Jesus and it was amazing. And then I, I worked for five years at a church before starting Life Church, and I started Life Church. And what happened, Sadie, is early on, I let ministry actually replace my intimacy with God. Hmm. And uh, I started uh, I started doing the work of God more than pursuing the heart of God. Hmm. And I, I heard someone else say this quote one time, so it's not original to me, but it was true to me. They said, the way I was doing the work of God was destroying the work of God in me. Wow. So, what I did back then is I, I prayed more to be heard by people than I did um, to be heard by God. Wow. I studied the scripture to teach the word rather than to, to feed on the word. And the image that I felt like, you know, that I can count on one hand the times I felt like God spoke to me, like, you know, or it wasn't audible, but I just felt that yeah. overwhelming sense it was God. So I felt like God said to me, you become a full-time pastor and a part-time follower of Christ. Wow. And... So I wasn't pursuing God. And I can only imagine, you know, right now someone listening might, might say, yeah, I'm a, part, I'm a full-time student and a part-time follower of Christ, or I'm a full-time whatever and part-time follower of Christ. And so yeah. I had to learn, and I had this tremendous guilt because I could never really, I wasn't like a prayer warrior. I always felt like I was an ADD prayer, couldn't pray a long <laughs> time. And so I, I'll tell you some things I've learned, and here's how I do better today. Several things. One is... Um, the word has to be a part of my life, not to preach, but to, to know and so and to internalize, to feed on. And so I just committed to read through the Bible um, year over year over year. And then I started doing it in different translations just so I'd read it in a different way. So I just wanted to, uh, if I can spend, if I can work out every day, certainly I can spend that much time reading the word, right? So, yeah. so I'm going to spend that, I'm going to internalize the word. Second thing for me would be my prayer life. I still can't pray for a long time, but I never go for a long time without praying. That's good. And so I would just say to people is you don't don't try to force your spiritual life into some box. Mm-hmm. I'm more like a text prayer. Like I'll pray a lot of short bursts of prayers toward God. That's good. And, and that works for me. If someone's a it's prayer awesome. warrior, pray, pray however it works for you. And then the other thing that's really, really big for me and for our marriage is that Amy and I pray together. 
And here's the thing that I just want to say is we didn't for years. I mean, I was a pastor and we didn't, you know, occasionally, but not regularly because I, it just felt like work to me. It felt like, yeah, yeah, this is like pastor work, whatever. And so we don't pray a lot and we don't pray long. But what we do is before I leave for work, we pray. And it's usually a relatively short prayer. But here's what's powerful about it is it's the beginning of our day. And you can't fight and pray together. That's it's, good. It's, right? That's so you true. have to work through things. Uh, it's really hard to have like secret addictions and pray together. So if there's something that you need to deal with, you kind of got to deal with it. And it's um, really hard to let your lives and marriage drift far from Christ if you start the day off in prayer together. So for me, it's consistency in the word. It's finding my own rhythms of a prayer life that that are they're different for everybody. And then it's praying with Amy. Of course, I, I really as a as a pastor into someone who loves the body of Christ, I think church is obviously way up there. Um, and then, and then I would just say there, I read a book years ago. I wish I could tell you the title of it, but basically it said there are seven, seven different ways people connect with God. It was really helpful. Mm -hmm. Some worship is a big connector. Some they see God in nature. Some it's actually serving people. Some it's just in, in, in the word. And it's went through all these different things and it broadened my view of, we don't have to connect with God in the same way. I've got six kids. That's good. My oldest one likes to text. My other one likes to get together and cry, cry and talk. My <laughs> third, my third daughter likes face to face. My son yeah. talks, cries, yells, whatever. <laughs> my youngest, my youngest son, it's talking after a certain time. And yeah. my youngest daughter, she'll sing. We we connect in different ways, right? Yeah. As the father, I connect with my children in different ways. Good. Our heavenly father connects with all all of us in different ways. And so, That's give great. yourself permission to connect with him in the way that's most intimate with you, and then just do it. That's Keep doing so it. good. Don't stop. That is so good. There's so much freedom in that and in your relationship with Christ because you're right, everyone's different. And I'm, I love the raw truth because I find myself um, in, the, in that sometimes too. I'm like, man, I better be talking to God as much as I'm talking about God. You know, uh, I right. had that little conviction last year that I realized, man, I'm talking a lot about God, but I'm not talking to Him near as much. Yeah. And so uh, I love that advice. Craig, this is so helpful from leadership in, in the church to marriage and family and uh, even just owning where you're at in, in college and where you're at in, in your first job, wherever it is, you've given us so much good advice. So thank you for that. Thank um, you. Yeah, truly, thank you. For everyone listening, please continue to dive into all the stuff that Craig's putting out, whether you're tuning into Live Church or going there if you're in the area. Also, his Craig Rochelle Leadership Podcast. And don't forget to get his new book, Lead Like It Matters. So much good advice. Um, again, Craig, thank you so much for just being, you and Amy both being such a good example to our generation and just um, honestly everyone who's alive right now with all the stuff that y'all put out to the world. It's, it's a gift to all of us. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me on. And, and thanks again, too, for um, serving our church and our podcast yeah. community. And we, we um, hope it's an annual event to have you and your Absolutely. husband. Absolutely. And I, I got to get my little workout with him. He's trying <laughs> to get me to get a cold plunge tub like oh, he does. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm all into the sauna, but when I saw him get into the cold plunge tub with his... <laughs> shirt off showing his Christian <laughs> muscles that took it to a whole nother level. Listen, uh, I if I can do it, anyone can do it. It, it actually <laughs> is awesome. It's worth the hype. It's worth the hype. And he might have exaggerated just a little bit on it being 35 degrees. I, I don't yeah, think it's actually. I thought he said 33. Maybe he did say 35. I'm going, come on, no. man. That's cold. That's he's, cold. He's being dramatic. He's being dramatic. <laughs> well, hey, we'd love to make it an annual thing. That'd be awesome. Thank uh, you so much. So yeah, good. Thanks. Good to be on with you.